Good afternoon, all of you, and welcome for, to this panel discussion. Uh, it is an honor and privilege on behalf of Annie Education Committee team in collaboration with AIG Hospitals Hyderabad to host this panel discussion on the occasion of Patient Safety Awareness Week 2024. May I now take this privilege to welcome Dr. Jyoti Clara Michael, our ex-founder, Vice President of ANEI, to welcome the gathering and to introduce our moderator. Madam Thank you, Jishita. On this special occasion of patient safety, we are here to commemorate and partner with the mission to make healthcare more safer for our patients. I would like to join hands with all the officials of ANI, Captain Ajita, the president, all the national and the state officials, ex-executive members and the current executive members. I extend warm welcome to all of you participants. You have logged in today by your choice. It shows that you are keen to learn. Please feel free to contribute and learn. And now I take privilege to thank, on behalf of Annie, the Education Committee, the entire team who has taken this program forward and made a meticulous plan with AAG Hospital. I take privilege in introducing Ms. Bindu George, who is the head of nursing of AAG Hospital. She was former head of nursing at Continental Hospitals Hyderabad. She has 12 years of academic and nursing experience. She is more than what is here you could see on the screen. A lady without a lamp who makes a lot of changes in nursing in her institution in Telangana and contributes widely. Bindu is also an ex-chairperson of Infusion Nursing Society of Hyderabad City, Secretary Association of Nurse Executives India Telangana Chapter, and she is also an NABH assessor. Who else is more competent to moderate this particular session? May I welcome Ms. Bindu George and all the speakers, and I wish this particular webinar to be a great success. Over to Bindu. Thank you, Ma'am Jyoti. Thank you everyone for joining in. Good afternoon, all of you. So all of you are aware that this is Patient Safety Awareness Week and we are attempting to discuss and further enhance our knowledge, which can be then put into practice in order to keep our patients safe under our care. Before I um, further go and introduce the panelists, I would just like to state here a few key facts that World Health Organization speaks about patient safety. Around one in every 10 patients is harmed in healthcare and more than 3 million deaths occur annually due to unsafe care. In low to middle income uh, countries, as many as 4 in 100 people die from unsafe care. Above 50% of harm, that is one in every 20 patients is preventable. Half of this harm is attributed to medications. Some estimates suggest that as many as 4 in 10 patients are harmed in primary and ambulatory settings, while up to 80% of this harm can be avoided. Common adverse events that may result in avoidable patient harm are medication errors, unsafe surgical procedures, healthcare-associated infections, diagnostic errors, patient falls, pressure ulcers, patient misidentification, unsafe blood transfusion, and venous thromboembolism. Patient harm potentially reduces global economic growth by 0.7% a year. On a global scale, the indirect cost of, uh, of harm amounts to trillions of US dollars each year. Investment in reducing patient harm can lead to significant financial savings and more importantly, better patient outcomes. 
I just stated these uh, key facts straight out of WHO's website, just for us to understand and know, because all of us are involved in patient care. I shall now um, go on with introduction of the panelists. Uh, the first panelist I would like to introduce uh, to all of you is Dr. Mamta Goswami, who has 14 years of experience at different designations in different organizations. She worked as a doctor in Asia's largest TB hospital, which is located in Delhi, uh, also a deputy commandant in Defense Forces, uh, has worked as a marketing professional in pharmaceuticals. She's participated in transition of a 60 bedded hospital to 250 bedded hospital and research institute in tribal areas. And she also worked as COO and medical superintendent of a 100 bedded NABH accredited hospital. Currently, she works as medical superintendent at AIG Hospitals Hyderabad. I wholeheartedly welcome you, Dr. Mamta. Uh, can you please unmute yourselves and keep your video on so all the uh, participants can see you? Uh, yeah. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, you are. Yeah. Thank you for your uh, warm welcome and uh, nice words. Thank you. May I now introduce Dr. Pragati Kotapalli? Uh, uh, she currently works as the infection control officer at AIG Hospitals by Hyderabad. Just to give a short uh, summary about herself, she's completed her MBBS and MD microbiology from the prestigious Andhra Medical College and Rangar College, respectively. Worked as a senior resident at Nizam's Institute of Medical Sciences, Hyderabad. Currently working as consultant clinical microbiologist and infection control officer here at AIG Hospitals, Gachibali, Hyderabad. He, she has a work experience of 10 years and she has the prestigious CIC certification in infection prevention and control. Some of you must be aware of this. Um, and uh, her area of expertise are clinical microbiology, hospital infection control, patient safety, antimicrobial stewardship, and NABH JCI accreditation standards. She's a lifetime member of Hospital Infection uh, Society of India, also of Indian Association of Medical Microbiology, and she's a member of Infectious Diseases Society of America. Member Secretary for uh, HIC, Hospital Infection Control uh, Committee, Medical Waste and Antimicrobial Stewardship Committees at AIG Hospitals, Hyderabad. She has 10 publications to her credit, out of which seven are internationally published and three are in national journals. We welcome you, Dr. Pragati. Uh, may, can you please unmute yourselves and have your video on? Welcome. Good evening, all. Thank you, Bindu. Thank you. May I now introduce uh, Mr. Mallikarjuna, uh, who is the Radiation Safety Officer uh, at AIG Hospitals, Hyderabad. Uh, so he is the Chief Medical Physicist and the Radiation uh, Safety Officer of the Department of Radiation Oncology at AIG Hospitals, Gachibali, Hyderabad. Um, welcome, Mr. Mallikarjuna. Can you please unmute yourselves? Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you. I now take this time, this opportunity to introduce Mr. G. Saithiran. He is qualified with uh, Master's in Engineering, MBA and LLB. 17 years of work experience in uh, various multinational organizations in areas of product development, troubleshooting, installation and application training has adequate knowledge of the processes involved in NABH accreditation and had been instrumental in helping the first NABH uh, accreditation of the hospital. He is well experienced in leading the successful completion of uh, 11 NABH and JCA accreditations. And this has been uh, achieved in different hospitals. An expert in medical equipment planning for new projects, uh, expansions and renovations. He's also an advisor to many healthcare companies and also uh, an eminent speaker in biomedical engineering forums. I wholeheartedly welcome Mr. G. Saikiran. Please unmute yourselves and have your video on. Thank you, Bindu. Thank you. May I now introduce Ms. Anuradha Bhatta, 
who is uh, AGM nursing in at AIG Hospitals Hyderabad. She is a dedicated registered nurse with 19 more than 19 years of experience at the bedside. And she is awarded as star performer at AIG Hospitals for the year 2019, 2020. She is also our patient safety officer and also recognized as best in charge nurse. Uh, we welcome Anuradha. Can we please uh, have you unmuted and have your video on? Anuradha there? Right. May we move on, uh, Ishita? We will. I would like to introduce Dr. Santosh, who is a clinical pharmacy manager at AIG Hospitals Hyderabad for the past five years. He ensures medication safety as our hospital's medication safety officer active member of committees like pharmacotherapy committee, risk reduction and antimicrobial stewardship committee. He's also the deputy coordinator of AIG Hospital's Adverse Drug Reactions Monitoring Center, overseeing adverse drug reaction reporting and management. He's a mentor for fifth year internship students in clinical pharmacy, providing guidance and support, contributes to hospital clinical trials, advancing uh, pharmaceutical research and patient care. Recognized as an eminent clinical pharmacist by GPRCP on Pharmacist Day 2021, he has achieved second position in a prestigious poster competition during National Pharmacovigilance Week 2023. He holds a doctorate of pharmacy degree from Vishnu College of Pharmacy, Bhimavaram. We welcome Dr. Santosh. Can you please unmute yourselves and have your video on? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your kind introduction. Thank you very much. So with this, uh, I suppose we have completed the um, uh, introduction of the panelists. So first, do no harm is the most fundamental principle of any healthcare services. No one should be harmed in healthcare organizations. But there is compelling evidence of a huge burden of avoidable patient harm globally across countries. This has major human, moral, ethical, and financial implications. So today's discussion is about how we can create a top of the class culture of safety for the patients through knowledge, processes, procedures, technology, environmental modifications, et cetera. So we have questions for the panelists. And uh, the first question, uh, is all the four questions are applicable to all the panelists and uh, the first person uh, to answer the first question is uh, Dr. Mamata. What's the contribution of your area of expertise to patient safety? Ma'am, I'll just uh, interrupt for a while here. Uh, may I request all the panelists to be on video? Please put on your videos. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Mamata, please. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. Am I audible? Okay. So, first of all, a warm welcome to all the participants and the viewers. And today we are here on the occasion of Patient Safety Week. And as Bindumam also said, first to no harm. So Hippocrates, he started the medicine with this basic premise of primum monocere, first to no harm. And this is like the basic tenet, basic premise on which the medicine stands. Uh, whatever we do, patients should go better off, not worse off than what he started in hospital. And as Vindumam also mentioned about the WHO statistics about how uh, patients are being harmed in hospital in different arenas, whether it's in terms of wrong transfusions or medication errors or all these things. So when uh, we talk about physicians, so from physician point of view, patient safety, it's a non-negotiable tenet that we have. So uh, 
whether we talk in terms of hospital infection control, whether we talk about hospital acquired infections. Uh, uh, Dr. Pragati is also here. She'll be sharing in much more details what all initiatives we are taking, that we are taking here. Then the medication error part, that is another important component where uh, Dr. Santosh will be talking about radi radiological safety as well as the patient safety where my other counterparts will be talking about. There are two important components which I like to talk from the physician point. The first is uh, the introduction of EMR that we are talking about. So in uh, our hospital in AIG, we are in the process of introducing EMR. So uh, we have introduced EMR almost 100% in the OP areas and in IP areas, we are in the process of introducing and implementing it to almost complete level. So this is one area that if implemented properly and uh, introduced in a proper manner, it is going to ensure the data accuracy and it will make the patient resources, the patient data access to all the stakeholders, whether it's the physician, whether it's the nurses, other departments, and that will uh, act as one area where we can uh, reduce the errors, which are there because of overlapping or not availability of that. So that is one part. Another part is, uh, which I have seen here in AIG is that we, uh, all the consultants here, all the physicians here, they are very really eager to introduce new ideas, uh, like evidence-based safety-oriented behaviors. For example, ultrasound-guided um, central line insertion, let's say. So, because we have the technology and with all such behaviors, we can reduce the patient uh, mistakes related to accuracy or trauma related to patient. And because of that, the patient safety. So, these are the things which we are talking when uh, it comes to patient safety from a physician perspective. But uh, I'm also in administration, so I also want to talk about patient safety from the administrative uh, perspective. Because in any hospital, in any setting, if we are talk about if I, we are talking about the patient safety, it must come from top down. So leadership or uh, the senior management of the hospital, they should also be uh, very much uh, in sync when we talk about the patient quality patient safety ideas. So this is somewhere I'll say ki AIG is very lucky. We have some very uh, sincere people at the top who are, uh, uh, it's unchallenging or uh, non-negotiable in their terms when it comes to patient quality or patient safety. And because of that, if we see in AIG, throughout the AIG, uh, whether it's in the policy, whether it's in the culture, that patient safety uh, is pretty evident. And uh, then is the validation part. So validation, if we talk about because of JIC, because of JCI, because of NABH, all these areas, we are constantly talking in terms of how we measure, how we validate whatever patient safety behaviors or patient safety measures we are taking. So constantly, uh, whatever the meetings we have, wherever we are talking about these things, we are constantly focusing on patient care, from the patient safety perspective. So this is, uh, uh, I guess, uh, your answer about what are the, uh, how we are taking care of the patient safety in AIG from physician as well as administrative point of view. Thank you, Dr. Mamata. I uh, extend the same question to Dr. Pragati. Uh, Dr. Pragati, you're in mute. So, good evening all. First of all, I would like to thank AIG Nursing Administration and uh, Annie Education Committee for taking this great initiative to create uh, awareness on patients' safety among all the staff. So, my role as an infection control officer is prevention of hospital-acquired infections. We all know that hospital-acquired infections pose a significant burden on all healthcare organizations worldwide. They lead to increased hospital stay, huge financial burden on the patients and their families. 
and uh, sometimes lead to long-term complications for which the patient needs additional treatment, apart from increasing mortality and morbidity. So every hospital should have a well-designed infection control program to, for patient safety, employee safety, and for the safety of uh, visitors as well. And as Dr. Mamta was mentioning, in this area, it is very, very important to take the leadership on board and leadership commitment is very important. And I must say that we are fortunate to have that in AIG right from the top management to the hospital administration involving both the medical and nursing administration. And also the uh, committee is very strong representing all the um, uh, heads of uh, various clinical departments, administrative heads, and we have regular uh, committee meetings every month. And all the problems are addressed here and uh, strategies are well planned and executed. Now at AIG, uh, how do, what are the steps that, or interventions that we take for uh, prevention of hospital acquired infections? First and foremost, all policies are evidence-based. And these, uh, since we are NABH and JCI accredited now, most of the policies are well implemented. And uh, strict implementation is again, always challenging, but uh, uh, we try to do as much as uh, possible. And among these standard precautions, we all know, they are a set of precautions which must be followed for every patient admitted to the hospital. And there's a big list here, about 10 of them, but I would like to uh, discuss about some of them. Hand, uh, we have a robust program for uh, hand hygiene uh, program implementation, both the uh, training as well as uh, implementation. We have about 300 to 350 hand hygiene champions who are nominated by the heads of different uh, departments and they are trained on this uh, hand hygiene modules and it is they are certified and it's their responsibility to ensure that all their uh, staff are receive training on hand hygiene and they practice hand hygiene so about uh, 200 champions from, from nursing department alone and they are all very involved and uh, try to do their best but with new staff uh, every time having uh, we do have uh, uh, challenges but it's a continuous uh, ongoing training program and uh, uh, training also we have at the time of uh, inductions and at least once in a year and periodic trainings uh, uh, whenever required again here we have huge support from the nursing education department as well in terms of competency assessment of their staff or uh, uh, periodical uh, trainings whenever there is an issue and not only uh, training but again evaluation of training is also a continuous process this we do randomly uh, through knowledge assessments by infection control nurses and if any concerns on training they're escalated to the respective departments and uh, uh, we try to take uh, actions. Then again, uh, we have uh, uh, vaccination programs, not only for the patients, but also the employees, because uh, this is to prevent cross transmission of infections to patients. Uh, because in some prime areas, like immunocompromised areas, vaccination of staff is also very important to prevent cross transmissions. And uh, quick identification and uh, isolation of patients is very, very important in preventing transmission of uh, infections. And surveillance is another uh, key role for infection control team, continuous monitoring for any hospital acquired infections, reporting them, then sharing feedback with the respective uh, departments for corrective and preventive actions. So these are some of the um, basic measures that we try to look at and implement for prevention of hospital-acquired infections. Thank you, Dr. Pragati. Anuradha, may you add in your points, please? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for this opportunity. So I'll be going to talk uh, about the uh, nurse's contribution towards the patient safety. So, uh, as I am the uh, safety officer here at AIG Hospital, I will be taking care of IPHG 6 also. So, uh, the more uh, important thing is that how the safety was concerned 
and uh, how the nurses are following the safety measures towards the patient care uh, so our nurses actually have a very important role uh, as they are the uh, frontline workers healthcare workers so they play very important and uh, role in the day to day uh, activities of their uh, patient care so uh, we have few such contributions such as uh, pressure ulcers needle stick injuries and uh, dvts and uh, the patient uh, uh, whatever the medication and how they are identifying before you know before administering the medication they are detecting they are identifying the errors and near miss errors also they are reporting us so mainly i want to talk on the uh, patient falls because since i am looking into that so the nurses contribution is uh, very high actually they since we actually aig has been already accredited with the jci so our nurses they are very much into the uh, into the all the patient safety measures they follow all the uh, ipg goals and uh, especially ipg 6 goal uh, goal number 6 is about the reduce the risk of patient falls so the nurses the way they educate to the patients about the fall education and uh, about the, uh, about the environment related the room orientation is uh, very extremely good because we have been done some audits uh, uh, to see whether it's really implementing or not where actually we are lacking so they really play a very good role by educating to the patients the other main challenge is about the pressure ulcers we been having a big uh, high setup of hospital having high all the time with high census with the uh, 500 plus census and we get all kind of sick patient from various uh, places to the aig hospital they come as they uh, hospital hospital acquired cases are uh, you know comparatively uh, less but you know committee acquired pressure ulcer cases will get more so for that patients to take care you know it is really uh, challenging and you know the nurses really do their contribution you know changing of the patient, patient position and early monitoring of the patient closely and checking the healing condition of the patient and uh, uh, and uh, the other important thing is about the hospital acquired infections as madam rightly told prasima so they really focus on the infection control practices and uh, to avoid further uh, diffusion of the patient other nurses also all the time you know they actually contribute their effort about the patient by closely monitoring the patient and see is there any uh, clinical uh, deterioration of the condition of the patient they closely follow up with the consultant uh, then they will try to you know all the time update them uh, with the patient condition and uh, documentation are uh, these some challenges we nurses will be there everywhere they are since the main spoc for the patients to communicate everything so the nurses uh, check with their day to day of their symptoms and uh, their condition and they will update to the uh, doctors and communicate to the patient and family and to the consultants other side so they have a really uh, good uh, patience to handle the attenders we we have the other uh, thing because most of the time uh, the nurses going to talk to the patient communicate back to the uh, to the patient and family the communication also is play, plays a very important vital role there yes ma'am thank you anuradha may i now request uh, mr sai kiran uh, uh, thank you once again uh, bindu george and uh, uh, ain ei uh, for organizing this webinar on uh, patient safety so uh, when uh, bindu has come to us uh, uh, to talk about uh, the biomedical contribution so uh, i thought it's a good opportunity uh, to detail because uh, the main stakeholders are the uh, nursing so uh, so what are the challenges and uh, uh, the contribution which the biomedical does uh, need to be known to uh, the nursing staff and uh, to the society so uh, so i would like to detail uh, uh, the biomedical engineering contribution uh, towards the patient safety so uh, biomedical engineering department contributes a, a major unseen role towards the patient safety like uh, if you look at an icu uh, patient is supported with full of medical <clears> equipments 
so uh, any equipment <coughs> mal functioning may lead to an adverse event so hence a biomedical engineer uh, has a prime responsibility to ensure uh, the all equipments are function properly uh, for precise deliverables uh biomedical engineering department uh, takes a uh, uh, diligent care of all medical equipments by performing uh, the regular preventive maintenances and uh, calibrations daily checks and uh, the electrical safety checks also so that will be done on an annually basis uh, so these are the prime uh, responsibilities uh, for the patient care and uh, biomedical engineers are available round the clock in the hospital to provide uh, immediate support uh, on uh, any uh, breakdown of equipment uh, with the defined that uh when we look at a surgical procedural areas like ot's so there could be a possibility of unexpected uh, or accidental breakdowns which may lead to the uh, patient risk uh, like ot table uh, may stop functioning uh, during the case and uh, uh, ot light may uh, work, may not work properly and uh, surgical diathermy is uh, may deliver the out of set frequencies uh, drills uh, may not function so uh, there are uh, uh, many such circumstances on a note of patient safety uh, hence uh, uh, we uh, strongly recommend an uh, uh, exclusive biomedical engineer is advised to ensure the patient safety uh, on a critical note and in the all the critical areas like ot's and icus where in the uh, major equipments are connected to address these issues uh, whenever there is a problem so uh, these are the major uh, contribution uh, areas where uh, biomedical department uh, plays uh, that's it thank you mr sai kiran i now extend the same question to dr santosh dr santosh yes ma'am hello ma'am am i audible yes 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 thank you uh, thank you any and nursing age nursing for conducting this wonderful discussion on the occasion of patient safety awareness week so i am here uh, take this opportunity to discuss about the vital role of the clinical pharmacy department in ensuring the patient safety so first and foremost the clinical pharmacist review the prescriptions meticulously to ensure their appropriateness and accuracy of the prescriptions so this includes the appropriateness of the drug dose frequency and the route of administration and we assess whether this prescribed drugs aligns with our evidence based guidelines or not and taking the various factors into consideration as patient diagnosis uh, renal hepatic function and other relevant clinical parameters and we do scrutinize the medication orders to identify is there any therapeutic duplications ensuring these patients are not prescribed with multiple medications with the similar therapeutic effects unnecessarily so and the patient safety is the paramount effect and we review the patient drug allergy records to identify any known allergies to prevent the prescription of of those particular uh, prescription of allergic drugs uh, most of the patients comes with the penicillin allergy sulfur drug allergy so we ensure the patients who are having the allergies are not prescribed with those medications during hospital stay and we do screen the prescriptions with respect to identify the potential drug drug interactions and drug food interactions with the help of uh, uh, so softwares like micromedex and up to date and we adhere to the hospital formulary guidelines and criteria for prescription of some medications like restricted antibiotics we need their pre authorizations before they are prescribing and administration and we need to follow the nar narcotic drug policy for all the narcotics like fentanyl morphine and uh, individual dosing is very crucial for patient safety so we consider various factors like patient body weight body surface area and hepatic function renal impairment uh, like uh, creatinine clearance and other physiological parameters to determine whether this prescribed dose is appropriate to the patient condition or not and we carefully assess the all other healthcare conditions and contraindications specific to that particular patients in Uh, giving the appropriate dose and coming to the second patient education patient education is the another cornerstone of our practice through counseling sessions we empower our patients with their knowledge about their medications from the dosing instructions till the potential side effects depends upon the patient knowledge and coming to transition of care we know uh, transition of care leads to medication errors so transition points in patients care particularly their well, very vulnerable moments where medication discrepancies can happen 
so clinical pharmacists step in these uh, transitions at the time of admission during inpatient transitions and at the time of discharge they they do reconcile the medications and they identify the inconsistencies and rectify them before uh, patient discharged to minimize the adverse effects with the medications beyond reconciliations the pharmacists are also a vigilant and continuously monitoring the patients uh, for the adverse drug reactions and as well as therapeutic response after introduction of first medication in their treatment plan to identify any adverse events further these pharmacists will report all the adverse drug reactions to our uh, ncc pharmacovigilance uh, pharmacovigilance program of india so these collaborations and our collaborations lies in the heart of the clinical pharmacy practice so we are like a liaison we work with our nurses we work with our doctors we work with our other healthcare professionals to ensure that we are providing the proper and appropriate medication management in our hospital so and we do conduct the pill count audits and the other audits to ensure the safe medication storage practices to ensure the medications are stored properly even they are out of the pharmacy like in the ward stock and ambulance so to maintain their efficacy and effectiveness so moreover clinical pharmacist has a major role in maintaining the trash cards so most of the hospitals nursing department are going to maintain in our organization uh, we are nursing department collaboratively maintain the trash cards we used to meticulously audit the crash cards on a timely basis and we ensure the replenishments of those medications in a appropriate time to ensure that crash cards are ready for the next code blues so and moreover education is a vital role in our so we do educate the healthcare professionals and nurses uh, on the medications dilutions and proper calculations uh, before administrations additionally these clinical pharmacists are well involved in the antimicrobial stewardship activities as well as clinical research activities to ensure all medications are appropriate appropriately done in short the clinical pharmacist can make such medications are safely used rational use with their expertise in medication management thank you ma'am thank you santosh i now uh, request mr mallikarjun to kindly explain your areas expertise to patient safety yeah good afternoon is it audible madam yeah okay good afternoon and thank you for giving me this opportunity to ani education committee and bindu jars madam and the nursing team and uh, actually when compared to other fields uh, patient safety radiation safety is very like a blank for the patients because other fields they can estimate okay this kind of uh, problems may i may face like side effects like that but because of this radiation they may not feel anything during the radiation exposure also after the radiation exposure also so it is very important to take care of the patient's safety towards radiation safety and it is in the hands of like a uh, healthcare professionals not in the hands of patient most of the things and i am working as a radiation safety officer in this hospital from the beginning of this hospital i am taking care of uh, radiation safety in radiology department nuclear medicine department and radiation oncology department so in nuclear medicine we do like a diagnostic procedures and therapeutic procedures also and oncology department we are doing like a therapeutic procedures and radiology department we all do like a diagnostic procedures so if you see in india arb is the regulatory body who can take care of all the regulatory guidelines and who frame all these regulatory guidelines and they will strictly implement all these guidelines and issue license so during the uh obtaining license there are so many steps like for example uh, for any x ray equipment we have to follow all the uh, guidelines then only we will be able to get the license for example procurement permission so we have to first procure a proper accepted like a type approved equipment only we, we should buy so any equipment in india if you want to buy first it should be approved by the arb once it is approved by arb only it is listed in the arb website then only we can apply for the equipment and we can proceed for the procurement so in that way arb is very strictly implemented earlier it is not like this like anybody can buy any equipment from abroad or india also so it may cause harmful effect to patient means they may not notice immediately but the harmful effects they may notice and they may not come to come back to us so in that way the first step they have implemented like a regulatory compliance and uh, the next one is 
uh, equipment evaluation and procurement. First, we have to evaluate the equipment, how best it will be useful for our patient safety. So there are many models in uh, in the market nowadays and which can give the instantaneous dose, how much dose we have delivered to the patient. So we have to choose a proper equipment in patient safety point of view. So next one is justification of procedures. Now it is in the uh, hands of the referring doctor. Suppose if a patient requires uh, MRI and CT scan, he has to justify whether which is the right procedure to avoid the radiation uh, complication, means radiation risk. So if the MRI is suitable and he is uh, able to get the enough information with the MRI or ultrasound, then we should suggest for the MRI. That is called justification. Justification means choose only if other non-radiation modalities are not fitting for this uh, diagnostic procedure. Another parameter means I am telling all these points which are directly or indirectly contributing to the patient safety. So another one is optimization of exposure. This is one of the very important uh, point for patient safety. Alarm is as low as reasonably achievable. So actually there, uh, in this small world, there is a lot of meaning. Everybody must understand and uh, they have to implement in their practice. Then only patient safety is achieved. Like alarm is as low as reasonably achievable means. For example, I am giving one example. Doctor prescribed abdomen CT scan. Because of the lack of knowledge, technician may be not understood that like, uh, abdomen means from where to where it will start. Where to... So he will take the complete scan from uh, neck to abdomen. Neck. So he is unnecessarily giving radiation dose to the patient. So that is one of the example. Like this, even while doing any fluoroscopy procedure, continuously is exposing when it is not required also. So in that way, technician or any staff is giving unnecessary radiation to the patient, so it should be reduced. Like ALARA principle must be understood properly in each and every radiation involved procedure and should be implemented in every radiation procedure. So next one is qualified, trained and skilled manpower should be there in any of the radiation equipment. Qualified, why I am telling, in some of the uh, diagnostic centers, because of uh, lack of uh, trained people and uh, qualified people, some unauthorized people also handling the radiation equipment. So it is not, it may harm to the patient. So only qualified and trained, skilled, means by practice, they will improve their skill and skill depends on the uh, person to person. But these two parameters are important, qualified and trained. People only should operate the uh, any radiation equipment, then we can ensure the patient safety. Another one is dosimetry and monitoring. Once radiation scan is done, for example, any procedure like CT scan, X-ray, fluoroscopy, any scan is done, we have to assess the dose delivered to the patient. Whether we have delivered uh, within the tolerance dose or we have exceeded or it is underdose. Underdose, it is no problem, but if we are exceeding, then we have to assess why it is exceeding. Is it because of patient is not cooperating? Is it because of technician is not aware of this uh, procedure? All these things we have to aware. Unfortunately, in India, AERB is taking care of all the regulatory uh, uh, regulatory guidelines for safety of the public and safety of the staff. Like staff, I am having this TLD badge. So I am ensuring that I am safe from the radiation. But for the patient, there is no uh, device which can measure the dose to the patient. So that is our responsibility, like a radiation safety officer and the staff who is working in radiation area. That is a, their prime responsibility is to maintain the dose in the diagnostic reference levels. Like uh, in India, it is not implemented and it is not followed by many centers. But uh, because of our hospital accredited by JCI, JCI is strictly uh, asking about this DRLS. DRLS means diagnostic reference levels. If any patient undergo any radiation procedure, there are some range like a CT scan of head, for example, 1 to 3 millisievert. So any, any patient undergo CT scan of head, his dose should not exceed more than 3 millisievert. If it is exceeding, then we are crossing the limit because of our lack of knowledge or because of our equipment is malfunctioning. All these things are uh, very important. So monitoring of dose is very important after the scan. Another one is quality assurance of the equipment. This periodic quality assurance checks ensure that we are delivering, we are delivering the accurate and consistent uh, radiation to the patient. For example, if quality assurance is not performed, 
uh, the machine is delivering like an inconsistent KV or MA parameter. So inconsistent means suppose for example the display is showing 50 KV and the de dose delivered to a uh, patient may be 40 or 30. Then the image quality will be poor. Then repetition is required. Repetition means unnecessary dose to the patient. So periodic quality assurance ensures that our machine is consistent and accurate. So that we are uh, giving a means we can reduce the repetition, repetition of scan and we can reduce the dose to the patient and then. another one is radiation risk communication suppose if any procedure is going to cause some uh, some detrimental effect like uh, for example uh, in our radiotherapy practice suppose some patients may get permanent infertility because of the radiation therapy treatment in that case before itself we have to explain to the patient so because of this radiation therapy treatment, there may be a, not there may be a chance. It definitely it will cause like a permanent infertility in future. So whether you want to proceed or not. So this is very, very important. And it, is, it should be included in the consent and the, we are following. So like this, there are so many steps with a, which are like directly or indirectly related to the patient safety. I have mentioned the top most like important points which can directly relate to the patient safety from radiation safety point of view. Thank you very much, Mr. Mallikarjun. All of you have enlightened, highlighted your uh, department's, uh, uh, you know, the role of ensuring patient safety. So what I have thought is we will not have discussion right now. We will wait for the end of the uh, panel. So the second and third questions I'm, you know, combining together and asking you. So these, this question is, what are the challenges you face in ensuring patient safety? And do you toy with any new idea in your mind or are you currently uh, experimenting any new uh, concept uh, in your department with regard to patient safety? This uh, first, I would like to request Dr. Pragati to take up this question. Dr. Pragati. The challenges. Sorry, am I audible now? Yes, yes. Oh. The challenges you face and uh, any new initiatives or new ideas that you are. Yeah. So challenges are many for infection control on day-to-day -day basis because uh, our work is mostly in implementation of our policies in other departments and uh, orientation and sensitization of the staff and uh, getting compliance is uh, uh, the major challenge. But then uh, uh, six years down the line with uh, NABA, JCI, that has become uh, 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 slightly easy. But again, we have uh, new staff coming every now and then. So I think uh, the compliance rate uh, is better when people know why we are asking or why they have to follow. It's uh, At the end of the day, it is all for uh, improved outcomes and patient safety. And uh, training, training is the most important uh, part in uh, implementation of infection control uh, protocols. And as I said earlier, we have uh, uh, defined uh, uh, schedules and uh, calendars for uh, uh, training with uh, periodical uh, trainings going on as and when required. And again, here we have uh, uh, good support from the uh, nursing education. So uh, as new staff come on, the challenges are always there. Again, uh, it's not always a knowledge gap, what we see. It is sometimes they know, they know it, but they don't comply. Then here uh, we escalate it to the respective departments. It is sometimes negligence, sometimes work pressure, or uh, sometimes uh, uh, skill has to be assessed, maybe um, it's mainly with the housekeeping staff. They have been trained several, several times, they know, still unable to uh, implement, so they, they, we have to do the uh, skill assessment. So we, it, it, through our random audits, we try to assess what is the challenge there and, and then address the problem accordingly. And uh, also us being uh, JCI accredited and we receive international patients. So we have to be always on alert for the emerging infectious diseases like the COVID pandemic we had recently and monkeypox, Jika, with all these now rapidly evolving pathogens, we always need to have the protocols in place to do, deal with any emergency uh, situation. 
and uh, again uh, rise of this uh, MDROs is a concern globally combating antibiotic resistant bacteria and we had uh, uh, some problem with, uh, with this because us being a tertiary center again we receive patients from all over the country and uh, they must have been admitted in hospitals elsewhere had a lot of antibiotic treatment previously multiple interventions so these are the uh, set of patients who are likely to harbor uh, resistant uh, bacteria, multi-drug resistant organisms and uh, uh, the nature of these pathogens is that they are easily spread by contact and have a huge outbreak potential. So uh, we need to have policies, well-defined policies in place to overcome all these things and with our experience over one year now we have all the uh, uh, policies in place. So at the point of uh, entry itself like the ER or through OP admissions, we have an NDRO screening form where the nurses screen the patient uh, using certain criteria. If they are um, ad had any procedures in the last three months, had been admitted outside or coming with invasive devices, if yes to any of these, they uh, screen them for NDROs by taking uh, nasal swabs, swabs from axilla, groin, and rectal swabs. That is to screen for the uh, major NDROs like MRSA, VRE, Candidoris, and the carbapenem resistant organisms. And right from ER itself, they are isolated and they go to the, they're shifted to uh, wards with uh, suspected MDRO sticker. So until the uh, report comes from the microbiology lab, all the barrier precautions are followed and the patient is uh, uh, treated as an infectious patient. And if the culture comes negative, then um, uh, just the standard precautions are followed. Otherwise, they are shifted to isolation wards. We have uh, designated uh, MDRO ward. And uh, this has been a great initiative from, again, the hospital and uh, medical and nursing uh, um, administration. And this has helped uh, us to streamline the process itself because uh, uh, whenever I used to ask for one is to one nursing staff for these patients, Bindu, <laughs> uh, it was her idea actually to create this uh, award and uh, uh, because there it becomes easy, uh, effective use of manpower. Three uh, VRE patients, one nurse, so one is to one staff uh, becomes easy. And not only that, these organisms are very sturdy. So it's difficult to uh, eliminate them from the environmental surfaces, unlike uh, other pathogens. And also there's a risk of biofilm formation on the medical devices, medical equipment. So we need very stringent cleaning protocols uh, uh, here. So we need well-trained staff, well-oriented uh, staff in these uh, specialized wards. So we could, uh, uh, with experience, face several challenges before we uh, came to this. And now it's all in the um, place. And also when these patients are shifted to any procedure areas, they have to be post, uh, posted as end of the day cases. But because I said the uh, cleaning protocols need to be very uh, stringent unless they're emergency cases. And uh, unless necessary, we don't ship these uh, patients, usually portable x-ray, portable ultrasound or any other uh, bedside investigations are arranged for most of these patients. And uh, yes, here we face huge challenges. First of all, counseling the patient for shifting to isolation rooms was not uh, easy, convincing the uh, patients and patients attenders and also the uh, consultants. So making everybody understand the importance of the uh, policy, uh, we did face some challenges, uh, but now uh, it's all uh, smooth. And uh, next is patient education. So as I said, if the patient is uh, trained or is uh, made aware of all the infection control protocols, he will they will comply better. Otherwise, uh, especially in uh, isolate transmission based precautions, why they have to uh, wear gowns or masks or why hand hygiene is important for him. So all this, I think, uh, patient education plays a major uh, role. And uh, like at every other place, we also have challenges with staff attrition, both among the housekeeping and the nursing. And one more challenge that we face is data management with the uh, 
uh, number of procedures or the patient loads we have. Right now, we are doing uh, manual data analysis. And as Dr. Mamta mentioned, uh, soon as we are moving to EMR and in process, because I think for infection control, real-time data uh, is very, very important uh, to take uh, immediate corrective and preventive actions in identifying the trends of infection spread, the rates, or an outbreak. So uh, immediate corrective actions can be taken if we have some uh, real-time uh, uh, data analysis uh, systems. So these have been some of our challenges and how we have uh, overcome them. And any innovation that I would uh, like to be uh, introduced for patient safety is I feel we should uh, make the patient responsible for uh, his own safety. Uh, for example, hand hygiene, if we take, if you uh, explain to the patient why he must do uh, hand hygiene, when he must do, demonstrate the hand hygiene technique and moreover empower him uh, in asking the healthcare providers like doctors and nurses, have you washed your hands before the doctor or the nurse uh, examines him? I think that would automatically increase the staff compliance rate. If the patient asks the doctor, doc, have you washed your hand? So this is one thing uh, we would like to introduce. Thank you very much, Dr. Pragati. You have actually and uh, you know uh, addressed question number two, three, and four. <laughs> so uh, that is well done. Um, so let me ask uh, the same thing to Anuradha. The challenges that you face in uh, ensuring patient safety and any new things that you are doing to ensure, to enhance patient safety? Anuradha, please. So from nursing side, mom, we have a challenges with the uh, continuous taking care of, uh, as Ma Pragati told rightly, for the infection patients. So we frequently post the nurses because they know the policy protocols of the infection control practices. So we give them, so the nurses actually bond out with uh, taking care of continuous them wearing them so that is one thing we have a challenge the other challenge with the ratio of managing the different kind of infection patients and the different nurses we have to give one is to one which is a really challenge for us to maintain manpower and the uh, other thing is that uh, in the emergency area in ic area uh, the nurses actually have a problem with the uh, patient that we, we don't know when they shout scream at the nurses uh, due to some kind of, you know, delay or uh, there is no proper communication about the patient condition of the The patient became violent and, you know, they tried to uh, raise their voice. That is one of the challenge. And uh, the other one, the other thing is that, you know, at the ER, if you look at the nurses, have a challenge to uh, face the uh, different kind of patients. They, they try to expose, they expose all kind of infections such as respiratory infections, tuberculosis, HCV and all. Quite of sometimes uh, in the emergency, they fail to maintain all kind of PPE to use. So that is one of the uh, main uh, great challenge we face. Uh, the other thing is stress. Uh, again, very uh, everywhere actually being a nurse uh, with very high workload, they have a lot of stress at the workplace. So that is one of the main challenge we face. And uh, being in gastroenterology hospital, we get a lot of patients, very sick and elderly patients we see here, and vulnerable patients. Taking care of them is again for us a challenge because we see try to reduce the number of patient falls. In spite of putting policies, protocols, everything, the patients again, uh, they fail to follow the policy and uh, protocols. They falls. And uh, we don't get proper support from the patient and family side as well. That is one of the uh, difficult challenge we are facing uh, in the hospital uh, to reduce the patient falls. The other one thing was uh, needle stick injuries also. And uh, in spite of having frequent training, CNEs and uh, workshops, but we still uh, there are uh, one, two reports will be there. Uh, of needle stick injuries are there and patient falls are continuously having a challenge for us to bring them into zero. So that is uh, our challenge. Uh, to, to prevent the patient falls, um, we have done some of the uh, new initiatives uh, uh, in the AIG hospital is that uh, 
we have prepared a, a good policy and a screening system and uh, to assist the patients on the all kind of vulnerable patients from the start, starting of the uh, entrance and, uh, we screen them and uh, we approach us uh, the patients who come to the uh, room we are giving the education about the cost prevention approaches we also created some of the uh, good videos for the training purpose to the employees in the hospital for the students and other employees uh, how to prevent the patient and who are at risk for the patient fall uh, what are the prevention preventive measures and uh, we made it as a mandatory training the through hr portal so all the healthcare workers can you know access to those uh, training and uh, to ensure the patients are uh, you know are taken care properly and uh, there is one new initiative also we brought it up what is the patient attender speaks about their patient calls because uh, are they leaving their patients alone are they not taking care of responsibility towards their patients we want to talk uh, listen to their side stories making stories of the patient families so which is helping us in the as the root cause analysis and uh, there is lot of interventions taken to reduce the uh, patient calls and uh, anti skid door mats which we implemented recently Uh, in the patient rooms and uh, in the dining area and main entrance everywhere so we see there is a change but uh, we hope to see and bring them to zero size mark thank you thank you anuradha uh, i would request the rest of the panelists to little bit rush so that you know we can uh, finish well in time uh, over to mr sai kiran yeah do uh so the challenges and uh, the novel ideas so the biggest challenge uh, what uh, we face is uh, training the end user uh, so the because the untrained operator can lead to a malfunction or mishandling of an equipment which is again a, a patient safety concern so uh, globally uh, we all are aware that our uh, skill force uh, nursing uh, has a huge demand globally so uh, there is a frequent uh, new nurse force are coming to the base uh, for patient services training them thoroughly on all uh, various equipments uh, are challengeable and uh, extra efforts have been put by both uh, biomedical engineering and uh, nursing education departments uh, to uh, solve this and uh, nowadays uh, the one more challenge uh, is uh, nowadays the patients and attendants are well educated and uh, uh, everything is there on their gadgets uh, internet on things uh, devices are in place so everyone is requesting uh, for their own and uh, known manufactured uh, equipments to uh, connect to the patients so and uh, convincing them is also a kind of challenge for us uh, and uh, for example today uh, we had a challenge uh, a patient has come and uh, as we have a two uh, ct scans a patient was asking for the year of manufacture of the ct scan then we asked uh, why uh, then he was saying that someone told him that uh, the new machine gives a uh, low radiation so he was he, he is uh, wanting to get the scan done in the new machine only so again uh, we counseled him and what aspects the radiation uh, will be given to the patient a low dosage and uh, the uh, area of uh, uh, the part which he is going to get scan so these are some challenges uh, which we uh, face on a day to day uh, basis and uh, when it comes to the uh, novel ideas part so uh, uh, in general uh, if you look at uh, the any hospital the electrical shocks uh, are one of the prime risk factor in the hospital the uh, most common problem which uh, the nursing also faced uh, in connecting the medical equipments are the power cuts uh, power cuts in the sockets uh, they use uh, the needle caps pens pencils and uh, other items for plug ins so it is a risk factor uh, that again uh, lead to a short circuits and uh, we have seen uh, some incidences uh, uh, in other countries and other states so which is like a, uh, affects the, the safety of nursing and the, both the patient to overcome this uh, as uh, recently uh, we are aware i believe that international standards are revised for the mobile phones uh, charging ports Uh, to universal c type uh, charging ports earlier there was a uh, b type and uh, uh, the usb type but now again the globally they have made it as c type uh, charging even the apple has changed their patented charging port to the c type so hence uh, uh, it should be a better if all the medical equipments uh, comes with a universal power cord uh, with the three pins because when we import some equipments there is a uh, uh, um, 
uh, industrial power sockets will come and the uh, 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 US based uh, the, the power sockets uh, of the US is different and Indian are different. So uh, we want to standardize that and we initiated here uh, to standardize all our medical equipments with the common power cord. So this is one of the uh, 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 ideas uh, which we are implementing. And uh, one more is uh, through this platform, I would like to uh, advise everyone, uh, the end user of the medical equipments is uh, both the nursing and doctors. It is uh, very important for the users to have empathy towards the equipment. So uh, as the uh, mishandling or the damage of the equipment also may lead to the risk of the patient. So uh, it is advised uh, to handle the medical equipment with utmost care and uh, empty. So that's it. Uh, so over to Bindu. Thank you very much. So equipment, sympathy, empathy, equipment, okay. biomedical equipment, empathy is something new that probably we are going to learn uh, from you, Sai Kiran. Thank you for that. I request uh, Dr. Santosh to uh, present. Yes. Yes. So we do have the several challenges that can impact our uh, safety, patient safety with respect to medication errors. And despite our best effects, medication errors can occur due to various factors like illegible handwritings, incomplete information in the prescription like salasa drugs, lookalike and sound like drugs, or the multiple communications or miscommunications during the transition of care, as we discussed. These communication barriers will impact the patient's safety so in many, and one more challenge is in many hospitals, even though not ever, there is a clinical pharmacy department. So I'm very fortunate to be in the part of AG hospitals. We have well-established clinical pharmacy department of around 50 people work along with the nursing and other healthcare professions under the guidance of our medical director, Dr. Naveen Reddy. So sometimes one more challenge is sometimes even doctors will not accept our recommendations and suggestions made by the clinical pharmacist. There are several factors due to as a difference in the clinical judgment, lack of awareness about the clinical pharmacy role, and sometimes just they are reluctant to the clinical pharmacist opinions. These are the some challenges from clinical pharmacy point of view. And coming to the new novel ideas. So I do, as we discussed previously, doctor used to prescribe uh, manually in the drug chart and nurses are going to inend those medications, which is a huge burden on nursing department and which prones to most of the medication errors due to loss of medications, incomplete information. Now we are going to implement the automated prescription entry, which enables and prevents the transcription errors made by DMOs and even prescription errors with incomplete information. This will definitely improve the medication errors complaints rate. And we are going to implement even the clinical decision supporting systems uh, integrated with EMR to give an automatic alerts when there is a drug drug interactions and drug food interactions and when there is a dosage adjustments required. So these are the two novel methods we are going to implement in our AG hospitals. So I request the other organizations to look for the clinical pharmacists. They may help you in reviewing the medication orders and to prevent the medication errors. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Santosh. Thanks. Mr. Mallikarjan. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I will just mention only two points and challenges in diagnostic radiology, actually maintaining the dose within the diagnostic reference levels is the more challenging in India now. Why? Because in India, ARB or any other um, body not specified the diagnostic reference levels. So individual hospitals and uh, medical centers, they have to collect the uh, diagnostic reference levels from the published uh, journals and literature and they have to follow. So it is a challenging one. If someone set guidelines, they will follow. If no guideline, then they may follow or they may not follow. So it is very challenging and uh, everyone should realize by themselves and they should implement. Maybe in future we may implement by our uh, ARB regulatory body also. So that is one of the challenging uh, topic. And uh, one more thing is in radiotherapy, delivering accurate dose to the cancer patient is the more challenging uh, task. So before delivering any radiation to the patient, we do so many quality assurance checks and cal calibration of the equipment, everything we do. But still, it is a challenging whether we have delivered accurate dose or not. So what we did in our hospital, we have participated in an external audit. It is conducting by IAEA and WHO. IAEA is an International Atomic Energy Agency and WHO jointly organizing an audit. What they do, they send a sample and they will ask you to deliver a specific dose, like a two-grade dose, deliver and send. That's all. 
so what they do they evaluate whether we have delivered accurate dose or not in our hospital we have exposed and sent that and they have evaluated and our uh, results are within 2% actually tolerance is 5% but our dose delivery is within less than 2% so we are sure that we are delivering accurate dose to the patient so this is how any challenge uh, is there is a possibility to overcome the challenges also so how there is how and uh, another question is uh, any novel idea novel idea means in future ai powered dose optimization methods are smart uh, radiation monitoring devices just now sikiran mentioned some patients is asking i may get more dose with the old model equipment so if any device is developed instantaneously patient will come to know the dose then this problem this kind of problems can be resolved but we are expecting in future those kind of devices thank, thank you madam mr mallikarjun lot of new informations that we have received from this yes, discussion uh, dr mamata uh, i think most of the areas they, the topics that have been covered uh, but so maybe yes, you can discuss on the patient's role in ensuring his own safety because i know these a uh, lot of your points have been discussed in this so the fourth question was how what is patient's role in ensuring his own safety maybe you can address that okay so uh, now if we talk about uh, healthcare and hospitals so hospitals today we it's not a small structure so hosp hospitals today we see they have become almost more like an industry so if we talk in terms of safety it's no more about patient safety it's about the employee safety also and safety of the public health public people so uh, because if hospitals are not maintained properly they can be a public hazard also and the hospital employees who are working in hospital they are also exposed to certain things so it's a very broader area now we are talking when it, when we talk in terms of safety and maybe that's why we are slowly leaning towards the theme also the safer together as they said in this theme this year so patient safety if we talk about it's not just about from uh, it's just the hospital's responsibility or hospital's duty it has to be a joint effort from the public from the patient and from the hospitals so it has to be a joint effort from everyone then only we can ensure that patient safety is maintained because patient safety now it's a continuum so whether it's the patient is inside the hospital or outside the hospital they have to take charge of their safety so it cannot be simply the hospital can be held responsible for everything and at the same time as somebody who are the pioneers when it comes to healthcare it is our responsibility also to train the patient as well as the caretakers to ensure the patient safety first thing with what we call the patient education second part is the consent so because when the informed consent are taken properly they ensure that the patient and the caretakers they are aware of all the risk and on all the alternatives they have all the benefits they have so we can take their decisions and that ensures the trust as well as patient safety is ensured so that is another area and the third part is transparency whatever we are doing at hospital we ensure some level of transparency so when all these things club and they will automatically uh, lead down to we are boil down to ensuring patient safety and improve quality but it is not simply we can say ki patient is uh, responsible or hospital is responsible it has to be everyone's responsibility uh, another area that uh, even uh, anuradha discussed about the stress part because i feel employees the hospital employees they also if they are healthy physically mentally emotionally they are stress free then only they can ensure the patient safety and because it's a very simple thing i can only give what i have if i'm not feeling right in the side i can't give that so similarly if our employees are well taken care of and the patients and their relatives their caretakers they also understand the thinking when they are expecting safety they have to provide they have to uh, give that in return they have to show that respect to our nursing staff to our healthcare personnel to our doctors who are working and they also 
not just question about patient safety, but also health. They also cover it. So once that kind of culture develops, I feel patient safety will uh, not become a challenge, but it will be something that everyone will ensure that happens and everyone will enjoy being part of that. Thank you, Dr. Mamata. Uh, so uh, almost the fourth question was, what is patient's role in ensuring patient safety? Two of you, Dr. Pragati and Dr. Mamata, has touched up on the topic. Anybody else in the among the panel, if yeah. you have a, a new point, yeah, um, from, from, yes, please. from my point of view, madam, yes. patient yes. safety is mainly they have to follow the doctor prescriptions and instructions. Most of the time they fail or they stop the doctor prescription and instructions. So that will lead to like a recurrence. Like for example, in our radiotherapy, they will take like a 20 fractions out of 30 fractions. And after that, they will stop the treatment. So definitely it will recur. We, we know whatever treatment he took, it is waste if they are not following the complete prescription. So it is applicable for many uh, prescription and instructions, I feel. So that is most important for the patient to, to be followed. So Thank I can, you. Do you have any point? Yeah, I have a point uh, wherein uh, the patient uh, and the patient attendants also the responsible. Uh, this is applicable uh, for the post recovery areas uh, like uh, uh, the Patient should be responsible for their uh, safety in view of the connected equipments, basically. So uh, in ICUs, anyhow, the nursing team is there uh, who can monitor the entire equipments. But in the rooms, uh, they are connected to the drug delivery uh, devices like syringe infusion pumps and the feeding pumps and the non-invasive ventilation devices like BiPAP, CPAPs. So uh, which may not be in a vigilant view of the nursing, uh, hence a support by responsibility from the patient or the attenders uh, in informing the alarms uh, which are getting or which are generating from the equipments uh, through the nurse call system. Anyhow, every uh, room will be having a nurse call system. Just uh, a support uh, uh, is there, then it would be a, uh, easy for ensuring the patient safety. Uh, if not, the overdosage may go and any occlusion alarms, uh, so which may uh, stop delivering the drugs. These all, this support is required from the uh, patient or the, and the attenders. And uh, one more is sometimes uh, patients or the patient attenders will operate the equipment by their own, like muting the alarm and the switching off the equipment without uh, noticing uh, or informing to the nursing or to the doctors. Again, uh, it is a uh, concern on the patient safety aspect and uh, uh, it is they responsible for informing immediately if they found any abnormalities uh, in the equipment uh, connected to them. Uh, this is uh, uh, from the biomedical perspective on the uh, responsibility of uh, their own equipment connected. Thank you very much. So I would like to uh, know if there are any questions, Ishita, for uh, any of the panelists. If not, we could uh, summarize and wind up. Very uh, fruitful discussion we have had. Yes, indeed. It was a very fruitful discussion. So we have one question from one of the delegates. That's for Dr. Pragati. Uh, there has been current dis discussions on less focus on contact isolation in MRSA, instead focusing on hand hygiene and vertical environmental sanitation. Dr. Pragati, what is your take on this? Ma'am, you're on mute, ma'am. So you can just repeat the question. It was about yeah. MRSA. There, was be there has been current discussions on less focus on con contact precautions or contact isolation in MRSA patients, instead focusing on hand hygiene and vertical environmental sanitation. So what is your take on this? Yes, as I mentioned, uh, MRSA in Indian settings uh, from our experience, because we screen all the patients, it's uh, uh, not uh, much of a problem uh, among them. But in Western uh, communities, it is very high and it's quite a, a serious problem as well. I think we should uh, follow contact precautions for these because, as I said, these have a potential for biofilm formation, both in the environment as well as in the medical equipment. And they spread very easily by touch. So when we say contact precautions, it's not only hand hygiene, but use of appropriate PPE like gloves and gown when you are in a close contact with the a patient and isolation to a single room with one is to one 
uh, nursing staff, dedicated medical equipment, all this is uh, uh, very important. Uh, but as I said, in Indian uh, community, as of now, it is less. But when you have an MRSA patient, uh, uh, this is a must because it is very uh, risky and they have a potential for causing bacterias and uh, disseminated infections and especially somebody having uh, uh, implant surgeries or so, the risk of MRSA bacteremia is very high and the mortality rates are very high. So whenever you have an MRSA case, uh, we have to follow all the uh, contact precautions. Uh, excuse me, uh, I'm not coming on video. Uh, can I just add to that question? Sure. sure. Yep. So Dr. Prakriti, the the discussion is about when patients are put on contact precaution, exactly as you said, less focus is on environmental sanitation. Because of that, there is possibility of MRSA spreading even after the patient is discharged. So that discussion is what is happening is that there's so much of, you know, focus on PPE and wearing gloves, but not paying attention to the, the bed, the handrails, the, you know, computer, whatever is there in the room. Mm -hmm. So that is the discussion. I understand Indian settings are different. So just uh, trying to emphasize the importance of environmental cleaning rather than only putting the signages and saying wear the PPE. No, 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 that is what... Uh, yeah, that's where the operational problem happened because I have been heading hospitals, so I understand what happens when mentally people will say. So uh, just to want to make a point, there's a lot of uh, in literature, evidence coming out on environmental sanitation. Uh, isolation is very important. I, As you said, it's very important, but there is no paper that comes out from India which says that what is the transmission risk after a patient is discharged from an isolation room what are the high touch areas which are growing something so if you have any experience around that that you know how environment is responsible for transferring organisms to others especially the mdros and they are very well known as you said stated on inorganic things all the furnitures and you know all the stuff which is there in the patient environment how do we manage that part there is enough literature to say that it uh, uh, is there in the environment. As I said, there are studies which say that this uh, MRSA can survive in the environment for about one and a half years. That's yes, why yes. these, exactly. uh, these organisms are very sturdy and form uh, biofilms on the medical, medical equipment. And the reason we are isolating is because uh, we will have more stringent infection, uh, I mean, cleaning protocols here. Like if you take a normal IP ward, our policy for normal IP wards uh, is cleaning with alcohol, but they not, that may not be enough for this kind of uh, room. So in isolation wards, it is with uh, a high level disinfectant like a hydrogen peroxide. So, so that the uh, staff in all these isolation wards know the cleaning policy. Sometimes what happens if there is an MRSA case in between normal patients, it is difficult to orient the staff on or the GDA on the cleaning protocol for this room, it is this, or the nursing staff as well as uh, uh, they keep on changing. So for uh, better implementation, that is the reason to have isolation room, not only just for wearing PP and going, but to put all these uh, protocols in place. Uh, place, yes. Okay, so it what I'm hearing from you is that MRSA patients once identified they are isolated and hydrogen peroxide is used for environment yes we need some high level disinfectants what we use is hydrogen peroxide it can okay. be glutaraldehyde or anything rather than a normal bacillol spray which is alcohol based okay so that is your protocol yeah then. our protocol the high touch surfaces are cleaned with a high level disinfectant and okay. the frequency will also be more like normally icus and all three times a day similarly isolation ward will also be three times a day high touch surface but if you take a normal ip ward we stratify the, all the areas uh, based on the risk so normal ip ward it may be only once a day the high touch surface cleaning okay Okay. So it becomes very difficult to orient the housekeeping staff on these cleaning um, protocols if you have cases uh, uh, here and there. It is. Uh, thank you so much because this is very important for people to understand the rationale for doing things which is different from 
maybe the USCDC recommendation. It's very important to understand the Indian context and also know the why part of it, you know. And this is a very enlightening discussion. Uh, I am I am actually listening to various multifaceted discussion. Thank you so much. I just have one more question for Dr. Pragati. Yes. Uh, please pardon me uh, to be asking you because I'm in the middle of running a course for ICNs. Sure. And all these discussions come there as well. So I like the ICNs to be more empowered and knowledgeable to know about environmental sanitation. So one more question, your screening of all patients for MDROs. No, no, we don't screen all patients again. We have a criteria. As I said, if they had any procedures in the last three months, if they had are coming from any outside hospitals or were admitted to our hospital or anywhere in the last one month or have been uh, are coming with any invasive devices uh, or any immunosuppressed patients. This is our criteria. This is your criteria. Is there is there any uh, national guidelines or international guidelines to do that? Yeah, there is. Uh, uh, there are CDC guidelines as well. There are many other risk factors, but again, it has to be your own hospital uh, policy. Like ours is a, a gastro center, so we uh, screen even all necrotizing pancreatitis cases. So depending on your hospital, your specialties also, you can uh, include the cases. So if it is only some gynec center, most of the cases will be clean, right? So yeah. for them, it may not be uh, necessary, but ours being a mainly gastro center, tertiary center, uh, so we have defined as per our hospital requirements. Ma'am, I think uh, Madam Thankam is uh, probably thinking of all patients get a screening questionnaire, Madam. And from okay. that screening questionnaire, we are able to isolate, okay, which criteria they have tick marked, yes. Then based on that, those patients get selected for the screening. There is a form which is to be filled no, by all nurses and uh, these questions will be there in that. And if it is a yes to any of these that I have mentioned, then swabs will be taken for that patient. Otherwise, they will not be, uh, they will not take the swabs. Okay, that sounds uh, uh, more, you know, use uh, what you call justifiable and very relevant for our settings. Yeah. So these patients where whom the swabs are taken till proven negative, they are kept in isolation. No, no, not kept in isolation. Uh, they they can be shifted to normal wards with that uh, sticker, but uh, all uh, protocols like barrier nursing will be followed until the uh, report from microbiology comes. Treated okay. as positive, potential positive. I'm just reiterating all the discussion for the benefit of the audience sitting here so that they take the right messages home. You know, uh, these are all confusing areas for many hospitals because I do get people from across India. So each one has got their own protocols on this thing. Best practices is best way of, you know, sharing with other hospitals to say, this is how you can think of doing it. Because if they look for any blanket guidelines, you will not find universal screening for any any or any of these in any uh, literature. So, but it is important to know what can be done in our Indian settings. Thank you so much for giving the explanation in detail. Thank you very much, and thanks Bindu for chipping in and telling that there is a form to stratify the risk. Right, stratification is a uh, actually a weak area in many hospitals unless the microbiologist is as strong as Dr. Pragati. Thank you. Thank you. So true. <laughs> Any more questions do we have? No, as of now, no questions. Only uh, that the session was very fruitful, good teamwork. We got a lot of positive uh, feedback. So uh, I would like to uh, thank all of the panelists and the listeners who have spent their time and I hope this was very fruitful for them. Whatever you have heard, whatever is implementable for you in your settings, please go ahead and do it. Knowledge uh, shall never uh, you know, be restricted to only knowledge. It should be put into action and that will help our patients uh, speedy recovery. Over to you, Ishita. Yes, ma'am, that was great. Uh, so on behalf of ANEI Education Committee and AIG Hospitals, I sincerely appreciate all the panelists and the moderator for their valuable contribution towards the candid discussion that we had on the theme Safer Together. Indeed, if we are safe, we'll definitely give the best care to our patients. 
So we know your time is very precious and we immensely grateful that you're able to carve out your some time from your busy schedule. Gratitude to all the participants and delegates who took out their time to attend the panel discussion. Looking forward for such uh, events in future in collaboration with ANEI and Education Committee of Educa and of ANEI as well as AIG in future events. Thank you one and all uh, for your time. Signing out, Ishita. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.